Hi, good morning, everyone. Good to see uh, all of you here today. Yeah, I know that uh, many of us uh, may not be here uh, for uh, the long weekend, okay, but uh, hope that when you come back, you'll catch up uh, with us in fellowship, maybe even catch the sermon today uh, that is also uh, on uh, the YouTube as well. So we are at the second part of uh, Haggai, and I want to invite you to t open your Bibles and turn with me to Haggai chapter 2. Would you do that? Haggai chapter 2, and let's grow together in looking at God's Word personally for ourselves. You know, uh, please help someone next to you if they're not sure how to find uh, it in the Bibles. Uh, if you're not sure, please feel comfortable to ask someone next to you to help, okay? If you don't have a Bible, uh, just ask our ushers. They'll be happy to get a free Bible uh, to you, our gift to you to encourage you in the habit of uh, bringing a Bible and reading God's Word together. So keep your finger uh, there on Haggai chapter 2. Uh, and uh, also, you can uh, download our sermon guide. <clears throat> okay, this is uh, something we've prepared for you, and we'll be using this more and more as we move ahead uh, to be able to help you follow better. Uh, there's some information, especially for Haggai, it's a complicated book, and so we'll put some background information there for you to read as well. Uh, if you're not so familiar yet with Haggai, that will help you to understand uh, all the, the, the things that are happening, okay? So you can get that, it's emailed to you as well, and you can also scan it and uh, download it as well, yeah? So we are looking at uh, this book, Haggai, through the lens of four C's, all right? Uh, the uh, whole uh, message uh, of uh, construction, okay? Courage, cleansing, and confidence, right? And uh, today we are going to focus on this second one, and I'm looking forward to uh, both uh, Manbin as well as Michael preaching uh, the rest of our series. Please do pray for us. As I said, it's not an easy book, we really are burdened in our hearts to speak God's heart and word to each and every one of us. So, so just keep us in prayer. Pray for your team and encourage them. Respond to them when they ask you to respond. You know, it encourages them. Smile when they ask you to smile uh, uh, because I, I think it will really draw the best of their gifts uh, from them. Can? All right. Can you all smile? Give me a smile. All right. Thank you so much. And you all look good when you smile. Turn to someone and say to them, you look good when you smile. Will you do that? All right. <clears throat> yeah? So we want to build this culture that you draw the best out of whoever is preaching uh, down here. Okay, all right. Uh, so I want to read to us uh, from uh, chapter 2, verse 1 to 9. Okay, so follow me there as I read uh, God's Word for us. On the twentieth day of the seventh month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Speak to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, to Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people. Ask them, who of you is left who saw this house and its former glory? How does it look to you now? Does it not seem to you like nothing? But now be strong, O Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord. And work, for I am with you, declares the Lord Almighty. This is what I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, and my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. This is what the Lord Almighty says. In a little while, I will once more shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake all nations, and the desired of all nations will come, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord Almighty. The silver is mine, the goal is mine, declares the Lord. The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. And in this place, I will grant peace, declares the Lord Almighty. So last week, we looked at the clarion call of construction. Okay? And to believe God for that revival, uh, to respond to God's word when He, he calls not just to, uh, for Haggai's temple, but our own church, New Life Baptist Church, to build her up to greater health and strength. And as I come in as your pastor, that's always my prayer for you. I hope that is your prayer as well. Amen? For the church to become stronger and healthier. The next two weeks, you know, we are looking at the ingredients uh, that are stated uh, over there. Uh, but today, we want to look at the first essential ingredient we need in order to build up God's house, and that is of courage. You know, we, when we start with uh, something, when we start on something new, it's usually exciting for the first time. You know, when you do something new, often at a time we find it adventure, you know. But if we try it and then it fails, and then we try it a second time or a third time and it fails again, 
that gets, it gets, becomes increasingly difficult, isn't it? In fact, it becomes painful. <clears throat> I know someone who started out on a, on a relationship. When it didn't work out, he was brokenhearted. You know, and he could not sleep well. He went to depression. He went to fear. He did not want to try relationships again for a long time. You know, I, I know someone who went into a, a startup business. You know, it was exciting, uh, but it, it did not work out. And when it did not work out, she was so despondent after that. Even though she went into a corporate job later, she just didn't seem the same again, you know. She lacked that fire and joy even in her work, always seeming like resigned that, wow, this is just my fate. You know, when we've gone through things that have broken us, often that past baggage pulls us down. The past can even hurt us. And at such times, more than ever before, we need to find a way to move ahead positively. We need to be able to, to journey with the Lord and, and, and move ahead in a, a good way. And perhaps some of us today are at that kind of a crossroads or juncture points where we are brokenhearted, where perhaps we have been burned by something that has happened, a work, a relationship or something like that. You know, And our decisions here can stagnate us or it can deepen us. And we have to make a choice to move in new trajectories and the difference is courage. This second chapter of Haggai looks at the corporate event of building the temple, but it would have also required every individual Israelite present that day, and I'll show you that in just a moment, okay, to have courage, courage to step out of the comfort zones, courage to believe God that He would do something again. And through our message, I'll be drawing more on the individual application of courage in our lives uh, that we go through times of change. So when is courage needed? Look with me at verse 3 in your Bibles. Keep your finger there because I'll be going through uh, our text uh, closely today. Verse 3 in your Bibles. It says this, Ask them who of you is left who saw this house in its former glory. <clears throat> so the year is 520 BC. There were some older people there who had actually seen Solomon's temple built 70 years before Okay, this event. Okay, and, and in the height of its glory, that's what happened. But in the year of 586 BC, they saw the Temple of Solomon burned down by the Babylonians. All the prayers that King Solomon made, all the miracles they had seen during that time regarding Solomon's temple was all gone. And I submit to you that courage is needed when you have experienced past painful failures and discouragements. Right? Courage is needed when we go through that. Look with me again at verse 3 in your Bibles. It says this, How does it look to you now? Does it not seem to you like nothing? The current temple never looked worse, the temple site right now. There had been an attempt to start rebuilding it in 538 BC, but then two years after that, it stalled because of resistance, and all that was left was a pile of foundations. Now, I, I, I uh, referenced it a bit last week, right? Uh, have you ever driven past a, a, a pile of foundations, you know, that uh, some uh, a builder was starting to build and it's had to stop for some reason and you, it's left fallow there for so long and you drive past every time you think, wow, this ugly piles of foundation, ugly piles of half built. What happened? Did, did the guy go bankrupt? Was there a, a, a supply chain problem? What an eyesore. I mean, you've ever seen that, right? Now imagine that kind of a pile of ugly foundations left there for 17 years. 17 years. I was just thinking that it's Isaiah. Is Isaiah here for a reason? Yeah, okay. So Isaiah was 10 years old. 17 years ago, right? About there, lah. He would have been a, a little boy. Now grow up over that years and to be a young man. That's how long it was. So you drive past that pile every day and Isaiah keeps growing up, growing up. You know, I was talking to Danielle's family just now, Daniel. Okay, all right. 17 years old, was she in diapers? I uh? can't remember, was she in diapers then? Uh? Or not, not even born yet, I'm not sure. Can you imagine? My little baby diaper grew up to be a beautiful young lady now, right? Huh? Yeah. And she was in diapers, drive past that pile every day until she become 7, 16, 17 years old. That's, that's how long it was. The foundations of the temple was left that long. Even new foundations at the time become old already. Look worn out, right? How can this old foundation ever compared to a full HDB block or a condo? How could this second temple ever compare with Solomon's temple? 
I submit to you that courage is needed when you seem to have less now than you had in the past. In the past, it was a lot. It was good. God was walking with us. Great. But now, even though you want to turn to God, everything seems so much less and poorer. Look at what happened when the foundations were laid, described by a parallel view of Ezra. Okay, because Ezra and Haggai overlap telling the story from different angles. Okay, and I'll show it to you on screen. And this is what it says. Many of the older priests and Levites and family heads who had seen the former temple wept aloud when they saw the foundation of this temple being laid while many others shouted for joy. No one could distinguish the sounds between the shouts of joy from the sounds of weeping because the people made so much noise and the sound was heard far away. Those who were new said, wow, praise the Lord. Those who were old said, oh, I'm so sad. This is a pale shadow. In applications for us, I wonder if some of us have gone through times where you had better times in the good old days. And now even what you have seems like a pale shadow. You know, a colleague in school once shared uh, where I worked in. He said, uh, I used to work in a corporate firm, but I was retrenched. And finally, I found a position in school teaching and on the subject of, of the business that I was in. And I find it so hard to go back to the corporate world. My interest really lies there. How I wish I could go back to that. But I'm so interested, but I've been feeling so depressed. So much time has passed. I don't know if I could ever go back there again. Should I just stay on here or should I try going back. You know, a father has a child that ran away and stays away because of a very big argument that the father and child had. And he often thinks of the time when the family was whole, when the, the children were close to them. Can he reach out to his child? Can he hold the family together again? Will things ever be the same? Things seem better in the past. A couple goes through an estrangement they both want to do what is right, but they know that, that, that there's so much effort involved in, in reaching out each other. They can't help but think of the times that they were both so in love, things that, you know, uh, uh, were so much better in the past. Do they have the courage to face their hurts and reach out again in forgiveness and grace? See, courage is needed when you seem to have less now compared to your past. And the people of Israel seeing these broken down foundations, there was a segment of them that wept and cried because they had seen the temple in former and better times. Would they have the courage to keep their faith and worship in God for this new season? And some of us today may be at that point of decision to rebuild something, to reclaim something. Maybe we need to rebuild the quality of our marriage again. Maybe it's the type of vocation industry you are passionate for that needs to be rebuilt. Maybe it's the building up of your parenting again despite lost time. Perhaps God is bringing these things to your mind and to your life where we realize the need for courage and the need to look to God to rebuild what was broken. And I want to share with you from Haggai chapter 2 on this theme of the pillars of courage needed for rebuilding. I want to use rebuilding here as a metaphor to build up our spiritual community, to build up our uh, families, to build up a career, to even build up our emotional resilience as we apply God's Word to ourselves. For the Christian believer, pillars of courage do not merely come by more methods or more expertise, you know, or more ways uh, uh, to do these things. No doubt they are all important. But for the Christian believer, it begins fundamentally with a belief it begins with the motivation that God desires us to be fruitful in all our ways. Do you, do you believe that? Yeah? God wants you to be fruitful. Help me do something. Turn to someone, say to them, you are going to be fruitful this season. Would you say that? See? So it begins not with our outer methods. It begins with God in our hearts. And what God wants for you, when you embrace it, when you begin to act on it, it becomes a pillar of courage for rebuilding. I want to share with us four pictures of God in this passage that may become for you four pillars of building and for some, rebuilding certain facets of our lives. Let's pause here. Let's ask God to speak to us about this. Let's ask the Holy Spirit to bless us. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for every brother and sister here today and even for those who will be watching this uh, video uh, in the coming days. That your Holy Spirit will bless them, you would uh, fill uh, uh, all of uh, the people who hear and listen to your word 
And I pray, O oh God, that you would stir our hearts, show us the areas that you are saying, this area, now is the time to rebuild. This area, now is the time to make it strong again. And the Lord says, I will be with you. I will give you courage. Father, I pray that you will bless them to have their faith, to step up in faith, to embrace what you want and to follow you. So bless this to our church. Make New Life Baptist be such a church, a church that is courageous to follow the Lord's leading in the coming season. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So the first pillar of courage for rebuilding things in our lives is the commitment of God. The commitment of God to us. Look with me in your Bibles in verse 5. And verse 5, it says this. This is what I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt. My spirit remains among you. Do not fear. You know, sometimes you watch movies, right? And then in the movies, uh, there is this scene where there's a flashback. You know? And then everything becomes black and white. Do you remember that? Black and white, right? And there's a flashback scene. And then there's one tagline that says, five years ago or something like that, right? Yeah. So right now, we are going to zoom back, okay? Backward, imagine I'm in black and white. Actually, I, I am in black and white. I just realized that, yeah? Okay? So uh, imagine, you know, the picture of this second temple we're talking about wavers and becomes a huge, big temple in all its glory. The people walking along the market, the market scene, all this, you know, suddenly becomes this scene again, you know? And it's a flashback, right? And it becomes the first big temple, Solomon's temple. And King Solomon is listening to God. And he's praying as the Lord has led him and, and put in his heart. And God makes a covenant that his spirit it will be upon them as they dedicate that temple. Listen to what uh, Solomon prays in this flashback scene. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command locusts to devour the land or send a plague among my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin, will heal their land. Now my eyes will be open, my ears attentive to the prayers offered to this place. I have chosen and consecrated this temple so that my name may be for there forever. My eyes and my heart will always be there. That was a covenant, a covenant that God had made with His people, a promise that God had put upon uh, that time of dedication. But today, we have a new covenant, a covenant that God's Spirit will be with us in Christ. And I want to show you the text between the similarities between the text in Haggai today and the book of John for us as believers in Christ. Haggai 2 says this, This is what I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt and my Spirit remains among you. Do not fear. Jesus Christ says this, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I've said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your heart be troubled and do not be afraid. Do you see the common phrases there that I just want to highlight for us? The first common phrase is, my Spirit is with you. Do you see that? Yes. There is no greater blessing when God says that my spirit is with you. The spirit is God's key to opening up many other things in our lives. In fact, Jesus says, as much as I love you guys, I long to always be here with you in fellowship, I would, it's better that I go away. It's better that I leave you because only then the Holy Spirit will come to you. And the second phrase that is repeated there in both verses, do you see that? What's the second phrase? What does it say? Say it aloud. Come on. One, two, three. Do not be afraid. The problem with man is that he fears all the time. He fears of not being able to enter school. Then he fears about entering the school after enter school can cope or not. Correct? He fears before taking the exam. After taking the exam, he fears whether he passed or not. Right? He fears some people fear about not getting married. And then when they are going to get married, they get fearful. People fear about things all the time. The Bible says 365 times, uh, if you count it, uh, do not fear. Someone said it was so because there's one day of do not, one do not fear for every day of, of our lives you know, in the year. If you're at a crossroad or juncture point where you need courage today, the first pillar of courage is the commitment of God to you. His Holy Spirit is in you. Do not fear. My Spirit is with you. Will you take heart? 
follow God's leading in your situation. The second pillar of courage for rebuilding things in our lives is the sovereignty of God. The sovereignty of God. Look with me in your Bibles at verse 6 of Haggai chapter 2. Chapter 2, verse 6. This is what the Lord Almighty says. In a little while, I will once more shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake all the nations and the desire of all nations will come and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord Almighty. <clears throat> you know, for all peoples at that time and even today, I believe so, the heavens are something that provide a covering for all of us. All right? The earth is really a foundation, you know, uh, of life okay, that we live upon. The sea is what provides water for us, right, to, to, to uh, uh, stay alive, you know. And the dry land, the place that we stand on, is the place where we work. We do have our livelihood, we, we have our, our moving in and moving out. We live there, we work in wherever is the local dry land where you are. And God's people in Israel would have felt that all these things, all these things had worked against them. At that point of time, they had been exiles in Babylon. They would be so for 70 years before returning uh, uh, in 586 BC. And then the nations had come against them. The temple had been destroyed. The gold and treasures had been looted. God's people would have held, felt that all these things would have worked against them. Their land was gone. They were taken, it was taken away from them. Their temple, their livelihood, everything was destroyed. The waters of Jordan were far away where they used to draw the waters. You remember what the psalmist says, by the rivers of Babylon, another river, you know. I would weep and remember Jerusalem. How could I ever forget Jerusalem? They were under the sky and stars of a foreign land, not their own land anymore. It would seem actually that, that heaven and earth and the sea and the land all conspired against them during this time. And similarly, for some of us today, you know, we are in situations where all circumstances around seem to go wrong at one time. They conspire against us, disadvantage us. Some years back when we had a bad financial crisis, I reached out to my friend who was in the financial industry then to ask if she was affected and whether she's okay. And she wrote me a very moving letter and I thought I'll read just an excerpt uh, of it, uh, what she wrote. She wrote this, Pastor Philip, I am thankful my husband has not yet been retrenched, but our careers are definitely affected. And so are our savings and investments that we have so painstakingly put aside for our retirement and financial independence. It's really a very humbling experience. And my friend writes this, uh, this is a season that God turns me back to him. God presented the best retirement plan for us, one that guarantees a lifetime of wealth and happiness in Job chapter 36, verse 11, which says, if they obey and serve him, they shall spend their days in prosperity, their years in pleasures. Yet very few brave souls dare to take it up. The requirements are simple, just obey and serve. But why do I find it so difficult? Friends, <clears throat> I wonder if today you are in a situation where circumstances all seem to work against you and that you have lost that stability, the covering and even the routine for life. What is the parallel today of heaven and earth and sea and dry land for you that provides that stability for livelihood? Is it your job? Is it your house and place to stay? Is it your retirement savings? And he, have some of these things, have some, some of these things been wrecked because of something that happened to disadvantage you. Verse 6 says this. This is what the Lord Almighty says, In a little while, I will once more shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. You see, verse 6, God is reminding His people, even if all these things conspire against you, I am the one that can shake and change these things. I'm the one that can shake the financial world, the, 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 the land where you stand on, the economic situation. Around. I'm the one that can sh shake it because I am in charge of these things. The name that God uses for himself when he says, because I am the Lord Almighty in Hebrew, actually is this word, the Lord of hosts. <clears throat> That's the name. It's a very distinct and specific name. The host here applies to an army going for war conscription and mastering of soldiers. God is the one that conscripts the army. God is the one that masters the, the army and soldiers to shake the nations. And in verses 6 through 9, God names himself as the Lord of hosts to his people five times in four verses. 
That's more than the frequency of one time per verse, okay? Five times in four verses, and that tells you what's on God's heart, isn't it? That God is doubly, triply, quadruply emphasizing His sovereign authority over all things. Do you trust the Lord of hosts in your life today? Do you trust that the Lord of hosts is in charge of the, your house, your retirement, your job, your family? That despite what has happened, will you trust God's sovereignty over you to be courageous? And that leads me to a third pillar of courage for rebuilding, and that is the providence of God. <clears throat> the providence of God. Look at me at verse 7 in your Bibles. It says, I will shake all the nations, and the desire of all nations will come, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord Almighty. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord. You see, the sovereign Lord had intervened to shake the socio-political economic frames of the world, but he didn't do it just because he's the sovereign God, just for sovereignty's sake, to show that he's God. He did it to provide for his people's needs. You know, Cyrus, who uh, had been king of uh, Media and Persia since 549 BC, fought and brought Babylon under his control. And the following year, he made an edict that allowed all peoples, including the Jews, to return to their native lands. And this is recorded even in secular historical uh, uh, documents, you know, uh, the uh, Nebuchadnezzar Chronicle, the Cyrus Cylinder, all these things recorded. And verse 7 of Haggai 2 describes, the desire of all nations will come back to God's house with glory. Bible commentators here refer, uh, say that it referred to the gold, the silver, the monies that finally came back. It was restored to the temple of God. And indeed, this did happen as God determined. Ezra, a parallel recording uh, of uh, that, that era, uh, writes this. However, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Babylon, uh, king of Cyrus issued a, a decree to uh, rebuild the house of God. And he even removed from uh, the temple of Babylon the gold and silver articles, the house of God, which Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple in Jerusalem and brought to the temple in Babylon. Then King Cyrus gave them to a man named Shalbazar, whom he uh, had appointed governor, and he told him, take these articles and go and deposit them in the temple of Jerusalem and rebuild the house of God on its site. So friends, you can see, even in history, with superpowers, you know, shaking and fighting against each other, the silver and gold belong to the Lord, and God restored it and gave it specifically for the rebuilding of the temple if God's people will obey what God had called them to do. Friends, when we want to obey what God wants us to do, the, head, the gold and the silver that the Lord gives comes to us to provide what we need in order to fulfill God's purposes. You know, many of you would know that I consult for churches and I had shared that before. I hope you don't mind I, uh, because I'm quite still new to getting to know all of us better. I'll share a few more stories from my life so you can get to know me better also. Huh? Uh, and after some time, you can piece a profile of your, of your pastor. Now, af after talking to God, I, I remember I, uh, before I launched into consulting for churches, I had always been very used to a, a mainstream job, you know, where you get a steady salary and you don't have to worry about, uh, you know, uh, my paymaster is this company, you know, with all the medical benefits and bonuses and all that. Then in 2006, I felt God move me out of being uh, uh, based uh, as a pastor in the local church into consulting for churches. And as God began to open doors to consult uh, for other churches, I, I learned to follow God and God began to divine, define His purpose for me, what I was I supposed to do specifically. And pastors around began to say, Philip, when you talk to us, you're not just like a pastor, like a consultant, you know, you think strategically, help us map different things. And I, I thought maybe that is what God is calling me to do. And that's what it, it shaped my journey to, to, to go uh, in this direction. <clears throat> and I said to God, uh, Lord, you need to provide for my family. My salary will always come from you. And by God's providence, uh, those uh, uh, two years or so, every month, my income never dropped below the amount I asked God for. Serious, never, you know. I, I, I saw all, all the, every month when I, I, I put total all that came, it always was above the amount that I said, God, I need this for my family livelihood. You know, I just never knew where it was going to come from, you know. If you ask me, uh, Philip, uh, your this month uh, and next month, how to pay the, how, uh, where is it coming from? I say, I don't know. I'm going to ask God, you know. 
God, how are next month? Uh, where, where is it all going to come from? <laughs> you know? And, and I asked God, I remember those days when near Christmas time, someone would send me a love gift and that was my bonus. You know, We didn't get bonus, right? Nothing, right? It's a bonus. Wow, it come. I just had to learn to stop worrying so much about the next month and focus on God's calling. And for some of us today, that might be the situation. God has called us to something. We are worried about many things. It might not be just money. It might be many other situations. You know, and, and you just got to learn to focus not so much on those things, to do what you need to do, but focus on what God has called you to. And God provides. Friends, our Lord Jesus Christ said uh, these words uh, to us. Do you all see it on screen? Huh? Let's read it out loud together, okay? One, two, three. The pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. <clears throat> But seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. God is not God just for sovereignty's sake. He wants to provide for you as you obey Him. That's why He didn't reveal Himself only as God. You know, He also revealed Himself as Father. God revealed Himself as Father God because He, did, he desired not just authority, He desired intimacy and relationship and providence as we get to know His heart and say, I want to follow my Father. Friends, when we truly, truly believe in God's providence, it gives us courage. Courage to step out of our comfort zone. Courage to find peace, you know, when we, we uh, 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 trust in the Lord. You know, courage, as it were, to, to, to trust God for our family and needs and uncertainty. You know, we need courage to do these things. Do you need this pillar of courage in your life today? And finally, as a house that needs four corners to be stable, a last and important fourth pillar of courage for rebuilding is the desire of God. The desire of God. Let me put up Haggai chapter 2, verse 9 on screen for us because there's a slight difference amongst Bible translations uh, due to the complex Hebrew language of this phrase. But for our purposes, I'm going to put up the ESV, okay? <clears throat> okay and this is what it says. The latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. The word glory here refers to that which honours the Lord, that lifts up the name of the Lord, the reputation of God. It, it, the reputation of God is lifted high. And the word peace here is not just I have peace vis-a-vis -vis, uh, conflict, you know, or I have peace vis-a-vis -vis anxiety. It's more than that. It's, it's the word shalom. Shalom actually means restedness in the Lord. Everyone say after me, restedness. Okay, it, it gives a, a kind of restedness and also a contentment in what the Lord has given to you. Everyone say after me, contentment. So shalom, peace refers to that wholesome restedness and contentment in all areas of our lives. That's the picture of shalom. It's a beautiful picture. That's why the, the, the Jewish people often use it as a, as a blessing to the people. Now, we know that the temple built under Haggai never did surpass the greatness of uh, the one built by Solomon in splendor. I mean, Solomon's temple was built in times where all of Israel's resources was at its peak. Solomon's temple even housed the Ark of the Covenant. Okay, we know that. Haggai's temple was built under duress. The building had stalled 17 years and rebuilt after that in exile. But despite being smaller, poorer, Haggai's temple, we call it the second temple, subsequently generated income and become the, the, the centre of Jewish identity here for generations to come. It in fact drew Jews from far distant land all over uh, towards that place as a centre of worship. 500 years later, this second temple was the same temple that Jesus Christ, the Son of God himself, came and stepped in and worshipped within. You see, it was not greater in splendour, but it was greater in glory. The presence of God its influence to other lands. Finally, the visit of Jesus Christ, the Son of God Himself, that brought the peace of the gospel in impacting people. The glory and the peace of the second temple was indeed greater than the first. Christian blogger James Jackson shared a very interesting insight drawn from Charles Spurgeon, the great 18th century preacher evangelist on Haggai chapter 2. And he asks this question, why was Haggai's temple not built with greater splendor as Solomon's temple was? He argued they had the heads of the Jewish houses supporting it. Zerubbabel, Haggai, Ezra were all that. They had King Darius of 
Cyrus and Babylon at that time uh, conquered the lands, blessing it. The treasuries of all the nations were returned to it. It possibly seemed that money was no object, right? There seemed to be little bureaucratic red tape. They had all the permits they needed to build a huge, magnificent temple. Why didn't they? And he shares this. My answer is, God didn't allow it. Charles Spurgeon had commented on Haggai 2 in this way. Spurgeon said, the second temple was never intended to be as great as the former. The second temple was intended to pass away. It was just interim for God to do His will, but finally to bring Jesus Christ into that temple, to bring Jesus Christ into the picture. The glory in Haggai chapter 2, verse 9 was not just gold or silver, but rather the work of God in reaching the Jews in other nations, and finally the presence of the work of Jesus Christ Himself that birthed the gospel for all nations. And the lesson to apply to us is this. We often think uh, the bigger, the better, the more sophisticated, you know, the stronger, the better for God. But it is not so with the way God works. We think if our income is good, wow, solid. If our job is respectable, we are a great witness for the Lord. Our family all behave well. We have the, the, the kids that are angelic in Sunday school, sit down, totally the teacher's favourite. You know, the, the, every teacher in, in school say, your son... Solid. I wish my son was there. Well, you are a great witness and testimony. Now, don't get me wrong, all these things are good. But God doesn't think bigger, larger, beautiful is better. Instead, He looks for us to trust and obey Him. How do we apply this? Someone I know <clears throat> tried for months to get a job. She applied to every job she could find. After months, landed a job that was so much lower in scope and salary than she was used to. She told me, Philip, this job that I'm doing now is what my assistant's assistant used to do. I'm just a glorified bookkeeper. And she said, I'm so disappointed. I'm a PMET, Professionals Manager, Executives, Technicians. PMETs are supposed to find good jobs. I can't find a good job at all. She was so frustrated. You know, income may not be as much, not as steady, not as certain in the job. Our job now may be less glamorous, less classy. Our families now have more cracks than in the past. We compare in the past, wow, we, we seem so much better. Now, more cracks, we can't handle it well. We feel the past was better. But I want to submit to you, is it possible that some of the good things of the past, God intended them only to be transient? So that you would never put your trust in these things but now to move you to a point where you will trust God now even more than you did in the past. Is it possible that God some, allowed some good things to pass away so you de don't depend on them all the time, but you depend on God today as He leads you into the future with uncertainty? Because sometimes God makes the latter glory and honour greater than the former one. And for that, He makes certain things transient. You know what I'm trying to say? Is it possible that the things that were good in the past, you ask, how come it didn't stay that way? And God would say, I never intended for it that way. I intended for it to be a stepping stone so that today, all the more, because you don't have as much in the past, it's more cracked than it was in the past. It's not as good as in the past. But you will give your heart and your eyes upon the Lord. And because you will not put your trust in any of these things, but only in the Lord, I will do greater things in your life than you could ever imagine compared to your past. When God leads and calls you, when you trust and obey, I believe that He will fill you with His presence. He will grow you into the shalom peace. And that is my prayer for you. As we grow older, how many of you here feel old already? Huh? Honestly, can I see your hands? Okay. I also join you. I feel old. Okay, my looking young is a spiritual gift. Okay, it's, it's just a gift. It's not, it's not true. Okay, and, and you know, as you grow older, you've gone through the hard knocks of life. And some of you, when you're growing up, you say, well, when I was walking the Lord, then oh, things was easier. Children were easier. Marriage was easier. Now there are more cracks, there are more holes, there are more gaps. But I want to say to you, as you grow older and you depend upon the Lord, you will reflect and you will say that God will do a new and marvellous work. 
you will say what God did in these later years of my life exceeded the greatness of His work in all these past years. That is my prayer for you. Amen? Amen. That that will be something that we will grow all together. This is God's desire for you. This is God's desire for you. And that is why it's a pillar of courage. That where you are now, you can step out in faith. Where things are crumbling and cracking, where your, your, your kids are not doing so well, your, your work is not doing so well, your finance is not so well. You can step out in courage and say, God, whatever happens, I will trust you more than ever before. And to step out in faith. And if you said today, God, I desire to grow my impact, my witness, to bring honour to the name of Jesus more and more today, in this season, in the past, friends, all of heaven stands behind you. All of heaven's resources will come down upon you because it has always been and will be God's desire for you. May you have courage to rebuild in this season. I want to invite the worship team to come up and take a position. I want to encourage us, okay, if you need to rebuild your career today and align it more with God, take courage. If you need to relook at your emotional health and well-being today, build it up to serve God better, take courage. If you need to draw your family together and build them up once more, no matter what state, eh, take courage. Don't give up on rebuilding the things that God desires you to. Don't give up being courageous. Come, let's pray. I wonder what God may be speaking to you today. As we talk about things that are broken and that you need the courage to rebuild, what are the things that God brings to mind? Some of us, you know, maybe the Holy Spirit is just prompting us to think about something. Say, oh wow, I've never thought about that for, for so long and now it seems that this is an area that God may be highlighting to me. But for some of us, it may be something you have carried in your heart for so long and you come before the Lord in tears, crying before the Lord. And when you hear this message, and you say, Oh God, this is an area of my life I've been praying for so long. I need a breakthrough. But whatever it is, I want to remind you that Jesus Christ is what makes the difference. That in these seasons, even when the, the house that you have, and metaphorically again, seems so much more in shambles than in the past. A pale shadow based compared to the glory of houses in the earlier years of your life. The Lord says, would you know that I allow this so that your eyes will be upon me, that you will trust and you will obey. And God says, will you be courageous? I am with you. Do the work. I am with you. Do not be afraid. Come, let's put our things down. Let's stand to our feet. I just let the worship team, the ideas will just lead us to respond to the Lord.
Come on, church. Let's tell the Lord, my God reigns. My God reigns. is a career that God wants us to rebuild. And God really desires your fruitfulness. He says, don't give up. For some of us, you know, uh, we need to trust God for His sovereignty. Maybe we're facing a very complex and difficult situation. And God says, I want to give you faith, faith to believe in my sovereignty, that I will shake the heavens and the earth to provide for you what you need to obey me and walk on my path. And you're saying, God, I, I, I need that. For some of us, we are saying, I need the providence of God. The providence of God comes. You know, I want to give a, a special invitation today. I know we don't often do this, but I want to invite you, if you feel God pressing on your heart today, stirring your heart, and that could really be the Holy Spirit speaking to you. And you know, God loves you. He, he, he desires such things for you. The desire of God is upon you. And I want to pray that the desire of His will just burn into your heart today and give you courage. But you know, courage is not something that we should just say, God, sitting down or just standing in your back and say, God, I just want this. I want to encourage you to 
act out your courage today. Say, God, I want this courage. Courage maybe in the relationship. Courage maybe in the finances. Courage maybe in a, 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 a work situation. Courage to have a, 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 a courage to, to, to face a difficult situation that maybe you're facing in your work or, or, or something else. Or courage even for your own life, your own sickness, your own health. Say, I need courage for God in this area. I want to invite you to come on out to the front and stand here as that act of courage and say, God, this is the courage I need. You, you, you see me, I'm here, I hear your voice. I want this courage. I need this today to have this breakthrough. I want to follow you. I want to build up things that have been broken. I'm, I'm hearing your voice. So I want to give you an opportunity. If that is the cry of your heart for courage, would you come up to the front? And by coming up to the front, you're saying, God, you see me. I'm really serious about this. I really want this from you. I want it with all my heart. I want it with all my heart. So we're going to sing the chorus again. And I want to invite you to come on up and I'm going to get, you know, some of the leaders and, 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 and council people to come and pray for you if you come up. All right, would you do that? We're going to ask for the Lord's blessing today. So as I, as we sing this one more time, this chorus, God is speaking to you. You just lay hold of God's word that's stirring in your heart. You don't worry about the person on the right or the left. You take courage. You come up and ask the Lord for His blessing. Come, let's do that. Shall we do that? My God reigns. My God reigns. Is there anyone? Would you just come on up? The Lord is speaking to you. Maybe about your children, maybe about your parents, maybe about your family situation or your finances. Come on up. God is speaking to you. Anyone else? Come. I want to invite the leaders to also come up. Just pray for these people. People in front, just pray for them. Some council members, you come on up. Just pray for them. Speaking to you. Come on up. I just want to invite you to respond to the Lord. Anyone else? God speaking to you. Come up. Come up as a family. Come up as a couple. Come up as a parent and child. Come on up. The Lord is speaking to you. Any more council members? Can I have council members able to come up and pray? Council members, please. just going to pray a blessing over all of us and I'm going to invite us to uh, dismiss from where you are and the ministry here can still continue okay so uh, stay up front okay just uh, enjoy the presence of the Lord in front we'll keep the house lights down okay even after dismissal come let's lift our hands to the Lord Father we look to you we just ask for your Holy Spirit to come just bless Lord each and every one of us as we seek your face May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of us now and every day. Amen.